Hello and welcome. Now is the time for our newest installment of our revised app tutorial series. We are going to cover our public service request app, which is a very high demand app for local governments. So some brief housekeeping before we go ahead and get started. As always, there will be a recorded version of the on-demand webinar afterwards on our site. So if you miss any information, don't worry, we'll have that available for an online resource whenever you may need it. Um, next is to please hold all questions to the end. We're going to have a designated time for a Q&A. It can be distracting to speakers if we're putting questions in during the actual webinar. So we will have a designated time at the end for that. And lastly, the best way to keep up with us is to follow us on social media to keep up with upcoming webinars. A little bit about us before we get started. It's the same as always, but it's still important to cover. Um, we've been in the business for over 20 years. So we have a lot of experience, an extremely developed and diverse team of employees. One of them is joining me here today as a panelist. We specialize in creating beautiful, accessible, and responsive government websites. And although we're headquartered in Troy, Michigan, we serve government agencies all across the US. So it doesn't matter what state you're in, we're able to help make you a website. And your hosts today are Thomas Jean, Special Projects Manager. Thanks so much for joining. And me, as always, Marketing Specialist, Danny Esterline. So before we get into Thomas's tutorial, which is going to be great because he has lots of experience with this app in particular, let's go into some of the key features of why this app is so important and how it's useful for municipalities and organizations. So public service requests actually allow residents to submit requests online. So they don't have to call into an office to submit their request. It's very user friendly. Residents can also track their request until completion, so it's great for accountability purposes. On an internal perspective, you can escalate the request to the relevant departments as uh, constituents are submitting requests. Thomas will sort of go into what that looks like with the app actually in his tutorial. And lastly, it's a great way for municipalities and organizations to allow residents to feel more heard by their community and also uh, submit their, their request of things they'd like to see done in their community. And now I'll hand it off to Thomas so that he can go over his portion of the public service requests. Hey, well, thank you everyone for joining. Some of you I know I've uh, either worked with you or uh, have worked with you in the past or will be working with you in the future. So thank you for uh, attending today. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Thomas Jean. I'm a project manager here. And um, I'm kind of, I, I would say maybe the resident expert on our public service request system. Um, so what you're looking at here, this is of course what we call our public service request system. You can call it whatever you want. Some of our clients, they'll call it like fix it or um, we've heard some pretty uh, unique and funky names that uh, different cities and counties have come up with. But um, in your website, you can have it embedded kind of like this client here has it. So it's actually embedded into their site. Um, or you can have it kind of full screen like this. Now, regardless of what you do, it's gonna work fantastically well on any device. It'll uh, reformat uh, and be fully responsive for that um, device. So this is what the public would see. And anywhere you see one of these little tick marks here, uh, that's an issue that has been submitted. Now these tick marks, they do not show publicly unless you allow them to show publicly. And you can do that on a case by case basis. Some of our clients, they'll just let everything go public. Some have none go public. I would say most are kind of a little bit of both. Uh, sometimes you'll get maybe a fake issue that's submitted or one that's really um, mean <laughs> toward you or, or maybe a neighbor. Uh, so that gives you the opportunity to hold it back from being publicly shown. Now, if someone has not uh, report, or if, if something has not already been reported on the map, someone else can, of course, report something new. And the way they would do that is, of course, they would just click report an issue. 
they would then either create an account or continue as a guest. Now, if you're using this system, we can actually limit these. So if you don't want guest users or you don't want to have users create an account, we can turn one of those off, but you have to have one of them at least. Um, so if I continue as a guest, I'll be brought directly back to the, uh, the map here and I'll have the option to move this little ticker anywhere on the map here. As you can see to the left, the address updates automatically based on where I move that ticker. You can also just type in the address if you want, or if you're on a device like a smartphone, you can share your location right here by clicking this button and it'll input the address based on your phone's uh, location. Uh, now from there, you then choose the issue that you wanna submit. These issues are customized to you, so you can have as many or as few as you want. We do have some clients where they'll just start with maybe one issue that's uh, super important to like dip their toes in the water of using this system and other clients, they'll just go all in and, and do all the issues. There is, um, I would say a recommended limit of like 10 to 12. Once you go past that, from what we've seen, um, it kind of can just confuse people. And um, generally those, you know, you know, number 13 and 14 issues that you add they're not getting virtually any responses anyway. So if you stick to no more than 10 or 12, you'll be in real good shape. Um, so you then choose your issue and each issue has a different or can have a different set of questions that can be required of uh, users to, to uh, address or to submit. I recommend actually one question to start with and that is just describe the issue. Uh, you can also have check boxes, you can have drop downs, you can have big text areas if you want. Generally, the more questions that you require someone to submit, um, the, the less responses that you're going to get. So just keep that in mind if you are using this system. I just like, please describe the issue because it gets right to the point. Um, so say it's a pothole, for example, I may say, um, I ran over this pothole. It broke my rim on my bicycle. Um, <laughs> I can then upload an image if I want to. I do not have to. Um, and I can do that directly from my phone. So I can snap an image directly from my phone or I can pull one off of uh, my desktop here, which that's what I'll do. Um, I can then keep it anonymous. That just keeps it anonymous from the public. It doesn't keep it anonymous from you. Um, the city. So maybe it's, I, maybe we just don't want our name shared publicly. So we click keep it anonymous. Now, because I'm a guest user, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but if I had an account and I signed up for the account, uh, keeping it anonymous would hide my name from the public. I then click report. And as soon as I click report, based on the issue category, which this issue category was pothole, based on that issue category, that's going to email a certain set of people in a certain order, also at certain time intervals. So for example, potholes might email three people in the matter of 20 minutes, um, and a water issue may email 10 people in the matter of five minutes if you want to. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose how many people get updated on this issue. And it will go through that escalation process until someone intervenes um, by responding to the issue or changing the status of the issue. Anyone that receives an email update in that escalation process, that email will give them a little information on the issue, like who submitted it, when it was submitted, that sort of thing. And it will give them a link that will take them to this dashboard that you see right here. Now we're not gonna go through everything in this dashboard today, um, but the most important one that you'll spend 95% of your time in is this incidents tab. At the very top, you can filter through all the incidents that have been submitted. You can filter by status, you can filter by the issue. Uh, maybe you just want the ones that are assigned to you and you just want them that are 10 days past due or nine days past due. Um, so you can get real granular with it if, you, if you'd like. Uh, usually or always the most recent submittal is gonna be right at the top. So this is the one that we just submitted, looks like. And from there, we can, we can view the issue or we can just click edit. By the way, there's user levels that some that if you only want certain folks to view the issue and not edit it, you can that can happen. So at the very top, we will see like the incident ID, the address, 
Uh, we'll then see the current status, which of course this is new. We'll see who it's currently assigned to. In this case, it's Robert, because he was the first person in the escalation process. We can then delete the incident. So maybe it's a picture of something that's totally irrelevant or the issue itself is just not real. Uh, you can delete it. That doesn't delete it from uh, the history of the system. It just deletes it from your queue and from the public ever seeing it. Obviously, there's a photo. So if a photo was submitted, you'll see it right there, uh, right away at the top. You can then acknowledge the incident if you'd like. If you acknowledge it by clicking yes and edit here, that's what triggers it going on the map publicly. So if you don't want the issue to be publicly displayed on the map, you just leave that as no. Uh, then from there, you can comment. Your comment can be public or private if you would like. Um, and you, of course, you can do both. So if you do a comment that's just private, that will update anyone within the department that you want to be updated. And it will also update the person that submitted the issue if they signed up for an account. If they didn't sign up for an account and you leave this comment not public, they won't see it. So sometimes what clients will do is they will send a very detailed comment back to the person that submitted the issue that's not public. And then they will also then send a more simple response that is public. So maybe something like, um, if you remember, this is about my bicycle that I, I, my rim was destroyed on. We may say, sorry about your bicycle. Bicycle, let's try to spell it right. We will um, fill the pothole within hours. And we then make that comment public. You can also add your own photo. So if you do go fill it um, and you want to submit a photo that's that shows the public that you've filled the pothole, you can. Um, I'll just go ahead and click add though. And as you can see, or as we should be able to see on the map publicly here, the most recent one should be submitted right there. And that's let's see, one of these is there. Oh, actually, I have to go acknowledge it first. I never acknowledged it. So we need to acknowledge it first. And I signed out, so we're doing a few things wrong here today, but <laughs> we'll get back to it. Um, give me one second here. All right, there we go. So we are acknowledged. Now, if you scroll down a little further in this incidents tab, you'll see all the information that you're looking for. You'll see uh, who it was submitted by, whether it was guest user or not. You'll see if there's a, how many public views have been there. Obviously, since it just came in, we're not going to have any public views or just the one. Latitude, longitude, um, any of the questions that you've asked them to respond to will be right there. And then all of your status history and comments are listed as well. So you'll see these status changes as you go through. Um, so maybe we want to, maybe we commented, we think we're good, and we want to change the status from new to in progress, we can do that. And you'll see now that we've changed it to in progress. And now maybe we, we're, we've filled the pothole and we want to close this issue out. So we do the same thing, click closed. Um, you can reassign it if you wanted to, you don't have to. And then you click edit. And now we see it closed there. Now, any of these actions that you take can trigger emails to certain people. So if you change the status, that could trigger an email back to the person that uh, submitted the issue uh, that tells them, hey, this issue is in progress and we're working on it. All of those emails, you can adjust the content of what they say and also who gets an update. So you could even have your internal staff updated simply when the status changes. Usually we don't see that. Usually internal staff is only getting emailed if they need to take an action on something, but you do have um, the flexibility to make those, uh, those changes. Now, when you close the issue, it does remove from the map. So you won't see it on the map any longer. We also have it set for after 30 days. If, if you have not closed it, it also removes from the map. Um, just so you don't have this thing over cluttered with things that are 30 days plus old. Um, all of these things you can export the data on. So if you want to run a full report, you just click reports here and you can run a bunch of different reports based on the department, based on the start and end date. Um, and it's very similar to the incidents here as well. So if, if you wanna do a report just in this incidents tab, you can do that too. As you can see, we have a lot of potholes. We have some damaged sidewalks here. 
and you can refer back to these at, uh, at any time. So, and then the last thing I'll show you here uh, today is just gonna be kind of the escalation process. So you can set these escalation processes based on the severity or the importance of the issue. For example, maybe a damaged sidewalk is something that is important, but doesn't need to be dealt with today. Um, in this case, it seems pretty important because we've got five people being updated within the span of a couple of days. Uh, myself being the first person, if I don't deal with that issue by changing the status or commenting, it'll go to my colleague Samir here after 12 hours. Same thing if after 18 hours, he doesn't do anything, it goes to Ellie and so on and so forth. If you want to change this completely, you can delete it. Um, you can also just add to it if you want. So if you need to add a sixth person to this chain, you can do that. And maybe in this case, we'll do two days and five hours. You can also exclude weekends and holidays. So if, if you don't want folks to be bothered on a weekend or a holiday, you can um, make that happen. In this case, we'll, we'll get Robert to be uh, updated here on the holiday. <laughs> Um, and of course, you can actually change those holidays. So if it's a city specific holiday or um, certain days of the year you're off, that's normally a business day, you can actually manipulate those um, at any time too. I won't get into the other things too, too, too heavily, but I just wanna briefly show you the, uh, the emails that I mentioned before. Um, won't be able to get into all of this, but basically these are the emails that get sent based on these trigger events to the far left. So incident created in form administration here, that's, this is the message you will get when someone submits something um, to you. Now, of course you can edit these. So if you've got specific things that you want someone there to do when this incident is submitted, you can add it here. So if we click edit, we can go say like, um, as a reminder, we must uh, fill this pothole within 48 hours, just to give your staff some uh, extra updates too. So this is a great system and it is one that you can launch currently on your, uh, your revised website or even a non-revised website. Um, if you're actually in the process of building a website with us, but it may not be ready for a few months, uh, you can do a launch of this system on your old website as kind of a, a soft launch or you know, dipping your toes into the water, so to speak. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you do not have to do all of your issues all at once. Um, a lot of our clients, they'll do like one or two to start. And then as they get the hang of it, they'll, uh, they'll add more, um, more issues that people can submit into it. Sometimes they, they, they pull it back as well. If they start with too many, they may narrow it down to just a few um, as well. So with that, I will go ahead and stop talking. Um, I've already kind of went over the time I wanted to, but uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for any questions. Feel free to uh, load those up in the chat and we'll get to them right, right now. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll answer them on a first come first serve basis. We'll wait a little bit longer. Okay, we have a first question. Okay. Um, Thomas, Ruth, Ruth asks, what is the cost? Do you want to take this away? What is the cost? Good question. We just kind of altered our pricing slightly and it is based on the somewhat the number of users and then also the expected uh, number of submissions. So it's gonna be different based on each client, but it is very competitive. There's a couple other systems like this out there that are kind of standalone um, third party products. And we are um, usually well less than what they are um, as of late anyway. That doesn't mean it's less valuable, um, but it's kind of uh, an easy integration with our site. So we're able to uh, make the cost a little bit less than kind of the industry standard out there. So definitely contact us and we can, uh, we can um, get you some pricing and it's very quick and transparent. So 
Um, next question from Ted Williams. We missed the beginning. Is this compatible with Android and iOS? It is. Um, any smartphone device, this works fantastically well uh, within. Now we don't automatically create a mobile app for this for you. Um, however, we can. If that's something that's important to you, we can definitely do that. Um, there's some, some drawbacks to doing that, um, but we can talk about those if that's important to you. Thanks, Thomas. I'll get this next one. Um, Michael asks if this video can be sent to participants. Um, so afterwards, we actually post this on our site, on our on-demand webinar section, and I can go ahead and shoot you an email as well as the other participants. That's not a problem. And we'll wait a little bit longer. Otherwise, we must have done a pretty good job of explaining it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the webinar. Thanks so much everybody for attending. And as always, you can catch the full demand version of this.